I'm going to talk about pulling the plug, uh, but not in like a fatalist, creepy way, but more of a, more about like the, the plug-in sense of, of the word. So one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here today is that we're working on a new um, project, which is uh, actually it was released this morning, which is an open source uh, specification of sorts. But before we get into all of that, uh, something that we kind of need to level about is what a plugin even is. So it sort of depends, I guess, on your, uh, on your angle. But if you look around like your kitchen, you have like a toaster and maybe an electric mixer. And all of those things are like independently useful tools. So those aren't really like plugins. But if you look at like a, a Mac monitor, that's more of a plugin because you can't really do anything with it if you don't have a Mac. Um, so the same thing is kind of true for software plugins because you, uh, you look around on NPM and you see like a thousand Gulp plugins and a thousand you know, Grunt plugins and a thousand middleware functions uh, and they're, they're aren't really, uh, they aren't really useful by themselves. They just wrap something else, right? WordPress plugins are like this too. And sometimes it's actually really hard to quantify like what does it really mean to be you plugin? Like what do you do in life? Um, and so people write these big long documentation pages about like what their plugin does and how to use it. And eventually it becomes its own proprietary like thing. And then it gets plugins too. So it's like this, this kind of terrible virus actually. Uh, so the thing that I, I have the most experience with is, is in the sales framework. When, uh, when we first started, we actually didn't have an ORM. And uh, we, we looked around, and there was a bunch of stuff that was pretty cool. And every kind of different early ORM for Node.js had a different way to plug in stuff. So there was, you know, there was SQLize, and there was JugglingDB, and they both had their own uh, separate kind of adapter interfaces. So what did we do? Well, we made another adapter interface, which, uh, looking back, I wish we would have found some way to kind of like standardize a little bit more. But it, was, uh, but it was good, and I thought it was really clever, and I was all proud of myself and, and, and grinning for a little while. But uh, where that led me to is like having these few really good adapters, and then just this huge suite of community adapters that are plugins for the ORM to talk to all these different databases, some of which are great, and then some of which are uh, not so great or a little out of date. So same thing happened again with, uh, with the asset pipeline. So we released version 0.9, and we were like, you know, we kept getting requests for CoffeeScript and less and SAS and everything else you can imagine. And so we were kind of like, we're going to just plug into Grunt. We're going to like rely on someone else this time. Um, and then what the fuck, this guy comes along. And then this like Coca-Cola's open source project or something. And it, uh, everyone wanted that now. And so now we couldn't even use the other standard. We had to, to make something else. So rather than that, we, we made the choice to, to make yet another specification. Um, and once again, we tried to use Yeoman at first, and it was great. It was just like slightly different, right? And uh, so, anyways, that led us down the path of like, you know, even as recently as a few months ago, people asked me, so when are, when is sales going to have plugins? And it's kind of like, but we already did that twice, you know? Um, because it never ends. Because if you tell someone, hey, require this module from the internet, right? You have no idea what you're going to get. You could be getting a function, which would be great sometimes, maybe. Uh, and you could be getting like a class, or you could get uh, some kind of weird jumbled, you know, defined properties sort of deal. Because JavaScript's crazy and anarchic; you can do anything you want. Um, and then there's like, but there's like tens of thousands of these things out there, uh, you know, for less, for SaaS, even for stuff like Twitter. Which is, which is not even a plugin. Like, you shouldn't have to make a Twitter plugin. It's like a real thing that exists on these servers somewhere. And so I started to be more along the line of like, maybe we just don't need any more plugins at all. Maybe what we need to do is come up with a better way to solve this problem. So I talked to Doug uh, from the Express Project about this, and he was kind of like, um, 
you know, yeah, middleware was pretty good for us, um, although all it is is these functions that return other functions. And it was kind of one of those brilliant little tidbits that just makes a lot of sense. But really, that's all middleware is. And, uh, and it's yet another thing that we all sort of depend on. And, but you write these rec and res functions, and then they become dependent on the request. So we need a way to liberate functions from these plugins. Because if you look around and you try to figure out like what, even, even in just NPM modules, like what do all of these things have? And what they have is just some functions. Because that's the way we like dangle around code, right? Um, so you, uh, you take a function. If you think about like a route, right, like to an API, uh, if you send an HTTP request, typically there'll be some sort of API documentation that tells you you know, whether it works for one thing, what the status code that's going to be the success code is, and then like what parameters you need to send to get some kind of response. Also, hopefully, like what does it actually do, right? Unless you're working with some like legacy e-commerce thing, and then you never know what you're going to actually get. But with functions, we actually don't have any of that, right? Like the best we get is like an occasional like stray comment left in the code that's like, you know, this function returns a value which is great, um, but there's this kind of the separation between what something does and how you use it. And to go back to the toaster, like, I don't really understand how a toaster works, yet somehow I've still been able to use a toaster for years, right? You just push down that little thing, and then it heats up, and then you, you got to remember to put the toast in first. If you don't, uh, you got to remember to stop it if it starts smoking as well. Um, and, and those are like, uh, that's pretty much it. Like, that's the usage documentation for the toaster. Um, so, like, if you're going to have a toast function, there's going to be arguments, right? Like, how far did you turn that wheel of death and fire over to the right? And then, like, you know, you know when did you actually hit stop? Because sometimes you can hit stop early, right? Like, kind of like throwing an exception. Um, so functions have arguments. They have a return value. In our toaster's case, it's toast. Um, and sometimes they have like little little nuggets of surprise too, like little uh, little side effects. And uh, so you know you bust that thing open, and you get these uh, you get these kind of very discrete sections. Uh, you actually have no way to talk about what a function does in your documentation if you ever even wrote documentation for a function. Um, that's kind of just like, you can, you can talk around it, you can speak in English, you can speak in French, any language, whatever you want, but the, the, there's no declarative understanding of that. But there is this like, thing that looks like fireworks are going off above all your functions, and that's JS doc or whatever, and, and that's pretty cool because it shows you the types, although it does make you feel like you're writing Java a little bit. Um, but it tells you, like, okay, here's what you've got to pass in and here's what you're going to give back, which is an awesome start. Um, but no one ever actually does that. And then you end up copying and pasting that a lot, and then it's actually completely wrong, right? So what we could do, maybe, is try to take that, like, fireworks thing and just, like, shove it into the function, right? Like, JavaScript lets you do some pretty crazy shit. Like, maybe we could just take it and shove it in there. So um, you, you kind of do that if you have like the options thing, right? You can just say like we're not going to have different numbers of arguments. There'll always be exactly one argument called like options or inputs, and uh, and that's cool because you don't have to remember the order anymore. But you still then you actually have to know the names of the arguments themselves because they're not really arguments anymore; they're inputs. Um, so now in this example, I have to know A, B, and C are my you know my my arguments. So that's cool. It's better, uh, I think, but it doesn't solve the, the root problem, which is that you still don't have that information documented in a way that's like intrinsic to the actual code. And uh, so it's kind of like functions by themselves are not like these, these things that, uh, that are alive. They're not aware of what they can do, right? It's like if you had a bunch of cassette tapes, y'all remember cassette tapes? You like rewind them and stuff. If, like if you were a kind of guy that you could pick up a cassette tape and just shove it into your forehead and then start doing whatever that cassette tape told you to do, that's what computer programs are like, which is insane. Um, and so I'm probably not making a whole lot of sense right now. But the, uh, there's a point to all this. Um, so what if we grabbed the stuff that we decorate functions with, and we sort of made something which is like a function plus blob thing, right? That you could call, and it would work. 
Um, but it also gave you these other benefits, like knowing what you needed to pass in, and maybe even knowing what you got back. So it turns out you can do that, um, and there's actually some, some nice advantages to it. So if you, if you go and, and add like examples to each of your inputs, um, you can actually crawl that and document it automatically. And not only can you infer the type from it, so you can do automatic type coercion, you can actually go and have like a pretty little like example next to each input. And you can actually make it so you, when you log the function, it tells you how to use it. Which, which is cool, because I forget everything. Um, and you can go further, you can actually add descriptions, you can say whether something's required or not, and then you can actually add a description to the function as a whole. So you can kind of say, like, it cooks toast. So, but that's not a function anymore. It's pretty cool, but uh, it's something different, right? And so we've been working on this for about a year now uh, in the sales core team, and we call them machines. Um, not in like the Turing machine sense, but more like in the sense of like a finite state automata. So the way you use these things, and they're actually out there, they've been kind of floating around without actually any GitHub repos or website to explain what they were. So it's maybe illuminating actually if you're seeing this for the first time, but um, there's these things called machine packs, which are like grocery bags full of machines. And they're usually grouped by category, but you can really make anything you want. And these are the things that go up on NPM. So if you go look up a pack on nodemachine.org, you can kind of see like, all right, these are the machines inside the pack. Here's what they all do, pretty much. And uh, here's how I install it and use it real quick. And, uh, but more importantly than that, you go and if you go and log that function, you're going to get a, uh, a little explanation like, these are the inputs that this function accepts, and here's what I can expect to get back. And you know that it always has the same function signature. So then you can call this, and it's pretty cool. Um, and that's only half the story, though, right? This is a synchronous function. So if we look at Node as a guide for conventions once again, we can see that there's, you know, there's usually like this objects argument that works kind of like you know, named arguments in Smalltalk or Objective-C or whatever. And then you have this callback thing. And by default, like, if you call the callback you know, with the first argument set to a thing that's truthy, then that means, hey, something went wrong. I don't really know what, but uh, hold on tight because you're in for a bad time. And then otherwise, like you're good and you send back some return value. Um, and then that's how you can keep from like crashing the server uh, unless you forget and you throw an exception. But, uh, but this isn't perfect, right? Because realistically, not every function has two exits. Um, and actually, if you're writing synchronous code, you might think a function only has one exit, right? You can only have one return statement, which is the biggest load of crap I've ever heard. Because um, if, you, if you think about like division, right, that's the easiest example. If you're going to divide a number and you put, you know, put zero as the denominator, like it doesn't really work, right? You're going to get infinity um, in JavaScript, which is nice, I guess, but it's, it's really kind of eluding the problem that underlies that. So if we take you know, that pattern, and we apply it to the machine thing. It works great, we can do everything, but plans don't always work out. Sometimes things go wrong, and you want to actually know not only what you'll get as a return value, but what every possible exit of the function could return to you, or if anything at all. And sometimes you don't actually need a value, right? So in this example, we have, you know, division, and we can actually check it on the outside in our code that's using this divide things function. And we can see, OK, well, if it's infinity, something went wrong, so I'll handle that code. Um, or if you wanted to get fancier, you could have like a special error object that you return that has a code property, right? And that's how most of us do this kind of thing right now, um, if you have time, right? And then you go and kind of negotiate that error. But the problem is, like, these two things are like parallel universes, because it, from that moment in time, your control flow has branched. And sometimes it'll reunite, but most of the time, it's gone. Like, you don't want to do any of those error things in the other case. And that is kind of the truth for most functions you write, which are asynchronous. So we can take the same thing we applied to inputs, and we can apply it to exits, actually. And we can say that, you know, by default, every function has got a success and an error exit. The error exit may never happen. Um, but we can kind of think that, you know, as a, as a base assumption. Um, and in the case of division, there's the case where it worked out, and then there's the case where you're trying to divide by zero. It didn't work out so well. And in that case, we actually don't even want a, 
return value, right? We just want to know that it didn't work. Um, and in fact, the, the very fact that you can't know is what's kept us, I think, from, from not being able to have functions be reusable completely for so long, right? Um, they're never really completely standalone. So anyways, you can do the same thing with exits you can do with inputs. You provide this metadata, it gets automatically documented, and uh, you're off to the races. So you have to extend your machine. You're like, you pull that negotiation to figure out what actually happened back into the machine itself, and then you call the appropriate uh, property on the callback, right? Machines can control their own destiny, and they know what's possible. They know what could go wrong. If you're going to rob a bank and you have a function call which is like, pull a gun out of pocket, you probably want to know what could possibly happen besides someone giving you money, right? And you don't actually care about the return value at that point if the police come running in. So the way you do this, and you can use this right now, uh, this one is not a real machine pack, but there's a few others. You, you, you know, install the thing, you require it, you check out the docs, you can kind of see how it works, what you need to pass in, then you start handling e exits, right? So handle the divide by zero case, handle the success case, and then go about your life and, and use that forward control flow to do what you need to do. And the great thing about this is that it doesn't throw in callbacks, right? The number one. Uh, and then number two, there's like a bunch of cool stuff that making functions declarative uh, can, can give you. So you have the ability to have stuff be documented automatically. A function or a machine will always give you the value that you expect and that's documented. And it'll actually validate that the stuff you pass in is right by the time it runs that code. Um, Plus, if it's referentially transparent or nullipotent, you can actually cache these things since it knows what the actual exit would be. But if you want to release a machine pack right now, npm publish it. Um, you can look at the examples that are already out there. We have about 50 machines so far, and uh, Facebook file system, et cetera, uh, are what's out there. You could pretty much wrap any API that already exists and just use the underlying npm module um, to give yourself the standardized interface. So it's called knownmachine.org uh, slash spec has kind of an interactive package JSON tutorial of what you need to put in there. But I look forward to seeing what everyone comes up with.